All right, Trinity Church, how are you doing this morning? Okay. I'm doing well. It's great to see you today. My name is Todd Arnett. I'm the lead pastor here at Trinity. Pleasure to get to be with you to kind of finish off this last Sunday of January in our um, kind of green room meeting. We mentioned one twelfth done. <laughs> I'm not trying to speed us up through 2022, but it's kind of wild, right? We're already a month through and looking forward into the next. I want to say I'm especially grateful to both the worship team, productions team. Our guest leader today is Alexis Arcega, and I appreciate I was off on my timing to come out and introduce her, and she's just like, hey, he's not here. Let's get started. So appreciate her very much being quick on her toes and doing a great job this morning. But that's who's helping lead with us with our great teams today. And they always do such an amazing job. Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to continue in this series. The video shows it. This is love. Jesus demonstrating love both in his actions and in his teaching. And we're going to wrap up kind of these first two chapters of this kind of last sequence of Jesus' time with his disciples. So if you have a Bible today, would you make your way, if I can speak, to John chapter 14. As you're doing that, a couple of reminders. There's some notes in the back, paper notes. But one of the things that we want to keep reminding you about is our app. I think our app is just an incredible tool to uh, do a lot of things, to be able to keep up to date with Trinity Church and to be able to find your way around. One of the things I love about it especially is that the ability to kind of track with notes, be able to keep a digital copy and be able to look back on that. Maybe if you're in a home group that's going through using the message as your kind of basis, it gives you that opportunity to look back on that. But there's a bunch of other things for events and different push notifications that we're working on just to be able to keep you just communicating well with you. That's really what the point of the app is all about. It's an opportunity to give uh, through that portal as well. So just a reminder, we have a Trinity app where if you don't have it on your phone, you, wherever you get apps for your phone, just go there and look up Trinity Church Redlands and you'll be able to download that. Also last week, you heard a save the date for um, an upcoming Mexico trip. It is uh, that March weekend, 18 to 20. There are folks out on the pavilion, on the plaza, who would love to help you with anything to just know more about that trip, begin getting signed up. One of the big reasons I wanted you to know about in January is that if you need to update a passport, I went to help my daughter update her passport in December, happened to look through mine and realized it had expired and I didn't even think about it. So those things happen, and so wanted you to be ready to go if you wanna be involved in that. So out in the plaza today, there's one of the tents out there. You can find out some more. All right, well, we're, we're gonna dive in today. Um, hopefully you have your Bible, you have your notes. We'll kind of take a look at this. Jesus has been, um, he begins in chapter 13 with this intense demonstration of humility gets down on his knees as a servant washes their feet. One of those even phrases we're gonna see next chapter, in chapter 15, he says, I don't need to wash all of you because you are clean, I just need to wash your feet, although not every one of you. It's referring, John helps us, he's referring to Judas. And then in the course now of this Passover meal that they're having, we call chapters 13 and 14 the upper room discourse. It is that last supper conversation, and we're wrapping up the last part of that today in chapter 14. And what we're going to see is, Bill said it really well a couple of weeks ago, is that what's happening in John chapter 13 and 14 is Jesus is kind of throwing out concepts that in some ways are either new or at least a new application of them. And he's throwing out a bunch of themes that he's going to double back to in chapters 15 and 16 and 17. So it's really interesting as we read today to not get this sense of, I got to know everything about this topic right now, because in just a couple more chapters, he's going to elaborate. But we are going to find some threads today, some threads that are going through this conversation. And it was powerful to me as I started working on next week's message in chapter 15, how much of that concept of abiding in Christ we're actually getting introduced to today. So I'm excited to dive in with you and we're gonna see Jesus is gonna share some things about the Holy Spirit that are brand new to them as far as the application of what that means in their lives as well as this idea that their obedience is meant to flow out of their love for Jesus. Watch this, just like Jesus's obedience to the Father flows out of his love for him. 
So all this paralleling is going to be really powerful. We're picking it up today. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see, you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So Jesus is the second half of John chapter 14. Jesus transitions the last thought that we looked at last week as we were closing, and he starts with this interesting axiom of an if then. If then. If you love me, then you will keep my commandments. That's how the Greek text kind of presents it as a dependent concept. If this is true, then this will be true too. If you love me, then you will obey, keep, observe the commands that I've given you. Now, on the one hand, when the disciples, right, in this, this, they're still in this Passover meal, when they hear these words, it really makes sense. If you love Jesus and he's in this kind of rabbi leadership, Messiah role to you as a disciple, you obviously ought to do the things he says. But then you realize, Jesus, we've seen you face to face and we weren't able to do the things you've said. Now you say you're leaving us. How much harder is this going to be? This is an impossible task. And Jesus couldn't agree more. And that's why he tells them he's going to do something. He's going to send them the spirit of truth. He's going to send them an advocate Now, in John's gospel, this is by far not the first time we become aware or introduced that there is this third person of the Trinity. We've heard a lot about the Father. We have heard a lot. John chapter 3, that worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. John, we'll see in just a second, John the baptizer said that's what Jesus would do. So we've heard a lot about these concepts that the Holy Spirit exists and that he's going to interact with them. But this is now, as we get to John 14, this is going to be the first time that Jesus is going to make this application. This is what the role of the Spirit looks like in you. This is new information, things they hadn't heard before. We said a minute ago about John the baptizer. This is all the way back in John chapter 1, verse 33. John speaking, and I I myself did not know him talking about Jesus, but the one who sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the man on whom you see the spirit come down and remain, and we talked about that at Jesus' baptism, the spirit in the form of a dove comes and rests on him, that one is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So John, the gospel writer, sets us up from the very beginning of the book very beginning of this story and says, John the baptizer says, this is gonna be one of the roles of this unique leader. Jesus, unlike anyone else, he's gonna baptize with the Holy Spirit, immerse his followers with the Holy Spirit. So here's what I wanna do. Over these next couple of chapters, we're gonna see a lot about the role of the Holy Spirit in not just his disciples' lives, but these disciples' lives in our lives as well. And while from John's gospel, we wouldn't want to develop an entire theology of the Holy Spirit, there's a lot that's here. And we're going to add on to it kind of week by week in this next part of the series. And I'm really excited about that because I feel like what happens a lot of times in churches like ours, we talk a lot about the Father. We talk a lot about the Son. And then who's that other guy? And it just happens for a host of reasons. And what I'm excited about, as we look at simply Jesus talking to his followers about the role of the Holy Spirit in their lives, would this be something that we grab onto and realize for every comment said about the role of the Holy Spirit in these 11 lives, 
That's true for us. That's intended for us too, Jesus' followers today. So look in your notes. Note this of the Spirit first. The Spirit is another advocate to help you. The Spirit is another advocate to help you. Now, that's a fascinating concept. First off, the idea of advocate, right? We don't use that word all the time, but that original Greek word has a powerful meaning. It says a legal advocate, so this is in kind of a legal context, like court, a legal advocate who makes the right judgment call. Why? Because of one's proximity to the situation. So you're not calling in someone who's unaware of the situation, unaware of the charges, unaware of the person potentially being on trial. This is someone who's close to the story. Someone who is a good advocate because they know the story backwards and forwards. And note that the adjective another, another advocate Jesus has been fulfilling this role with his disciples for three years. He is planning and preparing to leave them. So he tells them, I'm going to send another one to fulfill that role that I have been with you. Note that the spirit of truth will be with you forever. With you forever. So there's a permanence about this spirit's indwelling, that the spirit will remain. This is not just any spirit as it were. It's the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth, that's that identifier. This is the description of what this kind of advocate would be, one who, whose essence is a clear understanding of reality, one whose essence is understanding clearly right from wrong, truth from error. Think of the incredible value of having this indwelling spirit, not just those 11 in this upper room, but us today. This indwelling spirit of God, the spirit of truth, that helps us discern, helps us understand what is correct from what is false. That's one of the roles of the Spirit of God in our lives. Look at another descriptor. Will be unaccepted by the world because he is not seen or known. So the Spirit, this Holy Spirit, like you were to talk to someone in your life who's not a follower of Jesus and trying to explain who the Holy Spirit is, what his role is in a believer's life, this is a hard conversation. You're saying, so what? I mean, that's really weird. That borders on even some stuff about kind of like the, this, this, not just the spiritual world, but even some stuff that's just weird. What are you talking about? And, and that's really what this is. Jesus is telling them in advance People in your lives who are not followers of me won't get this. This is really confusing. And he he finishes in this part saying that the spirit lives with you and will be in you. Think about that. This is something that I think we overlook all the time. There are times when we process, we talk a lot, right, at Trinity, get in the sandals of the disciples, be in the story, be present when Jesus is healing that person, be present when Jesus is speaking to the crowds or to the religious leaders. Now what we're talking about is Jesus is saying, I have been that advocate. I have been close up and personal to you, but this spirit, he will stay with you forever, and he's not just near you as I have been. He's in you. The spirit of God will dwell in you. And that is, that is here's the thing I just need to say about that. Throughout all the gospels, until the very end Well, really, not even then. You really see it clearly in the beginning of Acts. Throughout all the Gospels, the disciples never had what you have. Is that powerful to stop and think about? The disciples never had the indwelling spirit until after Jesus ascends and the church begins at Pentecost. We have lived in that church age all along. The spirit has indwelt you from the moment you put your faith in Jesus. The very spirit of God lives in you. Now, that actually was not the first time anything like that would have happened. In the former covenant in the Old Testament, we read about the spirit of God came upon someone. Notable names, Samson, Saul, David. The spirit of the Lord came upon them and they were able to do amazing, powerful 
godly things. And so this idea of, but, but never would that spirit stay within that person their whole lives. It was a unique season and time, and then the spirit would leave. And so we process this and we go, wow, though, though we don't live in those ages with that kind of revelation, we have this revelation, the word of God, but we have the very spirit of God that indwells us. And all these things that we just read, not just that he indwells, but all these other descriptors, they are true. Now, isn't it fascinating? Next week when we get to um, John 15, that passage is well known for this idea of abiding, this, this imperative verb, abide in Christ, abide in the vine. But note that this word is first used because the spirit abides, remains in you. This is gonna be huge for when we get to what we look at next week. And for some of us, makes the concept of abiding in Christ all together a whole different conversation than the way you've thought of it before where it's been so much, oh Jesus, I'm trying to abide in you. It's so hard. Huh. How hard is it for the vine, the branch to abide in the vine? And we'll look at that next week. You're like, Todd, I don't know. Me neither. <laughs> so as we make note of these descriptors, we're going to keep a list as we go through John 14, John 15, 16, 17. We'll keep a list, but be encouraged by these descriptions of the Spirit of God that lives in you. And then here's what this brings is a great question for us today in your notes. Are you aware of and better equipped to follow Jesus because of the Spirit's presence and power in your life? Are you better equipped, are you aware of how the reality of the Spirit's presence and power in your life? And I would say that some of us need to consider a couple of questions. Have we, with maybe not intentionally obviously, but have we stymied the work, the, the, the influence of God's Spirit in our lives? If we go all the way back, my first opportunity to be with you in the the fall of 2016, we looked at the book of Ephesians and we finished in chapter five, be being filled with the spirit. There's this ongoing sense and what we saw was, it wasn't this, God, how can I get more of you in my life? God, it's how can I surrender more of my will, more of my desires, more of what I want for me over to the spirit to have that be being filled presence in me. Are some of us stymieing the work and the influence of the Spirit of God because of that we're not releasing control? Or are we trying to follow Jesus out of our own resources? Are we just trying harder all the time to do better? And I just got to tell you, it's not as though the, the New Testament doesn't present that we are called to a response. We're called to an activity, an activeness in our walk with the Lord. Our HSM Tuesday nights are going through 2 Peter 1, and we've called the whole series Strive. Make every effort to add to your faith these things. So there is an active role, but I'll tell you, without the Spirit of God in you, all you have is religion. You just have all kinds of sweat and tears and nothing that's producing long-term change because what you and I need, what you and I are after is transformation, not just more rule keeping. And the spirit of God is essential in that reality. I'm excited to look in the next few chapters with you and see our list grow. Jesus speaks to them more about making a promise to them that he will return to them. They won't be abandoned. They won't be orphaned. And he finishes this first part of our passage talking about where obedience flows from. We said it earlier today, it flows out of a love that we have for Jesus, just like Jesus is going to tell us today that his obedience flows out of a love he has for the Father. So hear this. We are not in any way saying that obedience is minimized. Obedience doesn't matter. Obedience matters a ton. It's the overflow, the evidence of love. Out of love for Jesus, we are gonna live lives that are obedient towards him. And anything less, any other motivation, we said it a minute ago, just 
smells of religion. And at Trinity Church, this is not a religious group of people. It's a group of people who are driven by a relationship with Jesus. And as a result of that, we want to continue to become more rooted in him as we're reaching our worlds. Let's continue. John chapter 14, verse 22. Then Judas, note, not Judas Iscariot. He's already left. He said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. I think the first part of these verses is really fascinating. Judas, not the one you think of when you think of Judas. John makes that clear. Ask Jesus a question that it seems as though Jesus doesn't answer. Let's rewind. This is Judas. Jesus, why are you going to keep yourself secret and not make yourself known to the world, but not, not make yourself known to those who are not your followers. Jesus, I don't understand that, because Jesus just said that a minute ago. I'm going to make myself known to you. So Judas asked this question, why aren't you going to make yourself known to others? Jesus says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Huh? I mean, it seems like this. It might, you have a friend today, and, and you're going to ask him, you're going to say, hey, peep, are you going to be watching the NFL playoff games today? I don't need you to answer. I didn't ask you. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but you're going to ask Pete that, and then Pete's going to say this. Guacamole is the most underrated condiment. <laughs> huh? Like, what on earth does that have to do with the question I asked? And that's what it seems like. It seems like Jesus didn't understand the question. He just misses it. We know better. We know better. And I want you to see, upon some further inspection, Jesus didn't misunderstand, nor did he begin philosophizing about guacamole. (laughs) Although I would agree, it's very underrated. It's so good. (laughs) Judas wants to know why the world, and we're talking about the world, we're talking about a group of people who are not on board, a group of people who are not part of those who are following Jesus, why the world isn't going to see Jesus, but yet in the future they will. Like, Jesus, why the secrecy And just revealing yourself to us, because again, remember, in the mindset of a disciple, Messiah is going to come, and one of the things he's going to do is he's going to definitely make himself known. He's going to make himself known so large and in charge, Rome is going to cower. We're getting our land back. We're getting our people back. This is the king. How... You can see the dissonance. If you're supposed to be the king, how's everyone not going to know that? That's a problem, Jesus. We're not a secret society. We expect you to do something huge. And what Jesus said is to me is so powerful. Look at, in your notes. He communicates a powerful truth. To those who love Jesus and follow his commands... He will come to them and dwell with them. He will be where he is invited by loving, obedient lives. He will be where he is invited. He will be made known among those who want to know him. Jesus is present. Jesus is revealing himself to people who actually want to be made aware, people who want to grow in their knowledge of him. But conversely, in your notes, And to those who don't love Jesus and don't follow his commands, he will not come and force himself on them. To those who want nothing to do with him, Jesus will not force himself on them. He will not invade. He will not by occupation come in and force his way. Remember the words, behold, I stand at the door and knock. What does it say? And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door. He does not say, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if you don't open, I'm breaking it down. (laughs) And here's to me the wildest thing. Because he's God, he totally could. 
He has every single right to break down the door and invade every life as he pleases. We're all his creatures. But this is the wild thing. He moves into spaces where he's invited. He looks where faith is. Because we see in Hebrews 11, faith is the essence. Nothing. We can never be pleasing to God apart from that. But where faith is, Jesus is. And that to me is so powerful. When you think about your own story, think of all the things you didn't know about Jesus. But what did you know? For many of you, we talked about it last week. You knew there was a hell. That was pretty scary. Good news is you knew there was a heaven and you knew there was a God who loved you and he put his son on a cross in your place. That's probably the skinny version of what you knew. Some of you did a deep dive into truth and there were so many questions you had and you were not gonna get there until you had answers. Others of us said, sounds good to me. Here's my point. Whether you did the deep dive initially or whether you said, are you telling me there's a God who loves me? Wherever you were on that realm where you had a degree of faith, a degree of interest, a degree of yes, Jesus. Here's the great news. He was there. And he did not have hoops for you to jump through. He did not have a list for you to accomplish. He was there. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Note the dwelling tent to make our home with them language. This is another thread we were looking at. This Greek word means an abiding place, not transitory, not a tent, but something lasting, something that's going to stay for a while. So it's the same word that Jesus used earlier in this chapter when he was describing these houses that, that he was going to go and prepare. In my Father's house are many dwellings, many rooms, abiding places, and I'm going to prepare them for you. So again, see the sequence of the story, the threads that John is weaving. All the way back to first one, or I'm sorry, chapter one. What does John say? Jesus left the Father, the Word left the Father, and made his dwelling among us. Chapter 14, I am going to leave you, and I'm going to the Father where I'm gonna prepare a new dwelling for you, and I'm gonna come back, and this time I'm not gonna be among you, I'm gonna scoop you up, and I'm gonna bring you there with me. And now watch this, in the in-between time, later on in chapter 14, that was just last week, just earlier in this same conversation, now in this second part, but in the meantime, my father and I are going to come, and we are going to make our home with you. It's this fascinating concept that John keeps weaving through the story. And we'll see more next week about what it means when we decidedly understand, when we lean in and abide, abide, dwell with him. Chapter 14, verse 25, all this I've spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Watch this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus wants to make it clear. He's saying this multiple times in chapters 13 through 17. I'm telling you this now because when it happens, it will give you confidence. When it happens, it will help you realize that's what he was talking about. So Jesus is laying out a whole bunch of things that are to come, and he's trying to build a foundation for faith. He's giving evidence to faith, and I think that's a powerful thing. When I mentioned earlier about faith, some of us have in our minds that faith is just this giant leap into nothing. There's no basis for it. It's just kind of crazy talk. Just step out and see what happens. Biblical faith is always informed. Why? Because God is a God of revelation. 
God wants you to know him, and he reveals himself to you. Before you would ever put your faith in Christ, Romans 1 says that God revealed himself through the created order. You look around and you go. Well, when you look around, you just see the roof of this building, so it doesn't help much. But, but when you're outside <clears throat> and you look around and you go, God, I don't even know your name. I don't even know what to call you, but you've done something. You, there is a mover behind this. And when you're trying to figure out who to give thanks to, that's the next steps of Revelation. So God wants you to know him, and he's wanting his disciples to understand some things before they happen, so their strength will be, I'm sorry, their faith will be strengthened when they do. He gives some more descriptors. We're making a list, right, of the Holy Spirit. See what else is there. Whom the Father will send in Jesus' name. So we realize that the Spirit of God coming to these disciples, coming to us, is commissioned, sent by the Father, but in line, in alignment with the mission of Jesus. That's what it means to be in Jesus' name, fully aligned with everything Jesus came to do. That's who the Spirit is, and it's going to be commissioned by the Father. And the Spirit will teach you all things. The Spirit will teach you all things. I want you to think about this for a minute. We said a few minutes ago that the Spirit was a Spirit of truth. We saw the incredible value of not being people who are just amiss with all kinds of floating ideas and, and never really knowing reality. And one of the things that the Spirit of God is doing as the Spirit indwells us is to help us understand truth. But here's how. Because he teaches us. It's not just that the Spirit possesses or the essence of the Spirit is truth. The Spirit teaches us truth. Now, this is kind of wild. Many of us are still convinced that the people who seem to understand the word of God, the people who tend to understand truth the best, are smart. They're intellectual. And I'm not saying that intellectual people don't amaze me with the things they see and understand in scripture, but I do want you to hear this. No matter where you rank on an IQ test, no matter how gifted you are at intellectual understanding, the way we learn, the way we grow in spiritual truth is because of the indwelling spirit of God. And that means, in a beautiful way, we are all on the same playing field. You don't need to feel inferior because you're pegging at an 84 on that Richter scale, right? It's not a Richter scale, but the EQ thing, IQ thing. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to go, well, God, I can never really understand. Get my arms around spiritual truth because I'm just not smart. That's not the descriptor. Do you have the spirit of God living in your life? And is that spirit not the spirit of truth? And does that spirit not teach you? Yes and yes. Equally so, those of us who are very intelligent, let me rephrase, those of you who are very intelligent, <laughs> I know better to include myself in that group, those of you that are very intelligent ought not think that the revelation, the understanding of spiritual truth is yours because you're smart. Anything that you have according to the truth of God coming from the Spirit comes simply because the Spirit indwells you. It's a beautiful, wonderful truth and puts us on a playing field where we can say, God, that's awesome, thank you. That my intelligence or lack thereof does not mean I'm either overly or underly available to understand and to walk in a way pleasing to you. Another descriptor, remind you of everything I've said to you. Remind you of everything I've said to you, not just teach you, not just illuminate and help you understand, but I, the Spirit of God will remind you of everything I've taught you. This means that the disciples could teach, 
They could preach. They could even write things like John's gospel because the Spirit of God was illuminating them to help them remember, what did Jesus say two years ago? What did Jesus say five years ago? We see it in other places of Scripture that the Spirit of God moved men along to write down these words. So there is a very, when we talk about biblical inspiration, God breathed, that's what we're talking about. This is a role of the Holy Spirit. But the wild thing is that the Spirit of God would remind them of things even that they had forgotten. I love in another part in, in, uh, in this sequence and then later on in the book of Acts, Jesus is reminding them, don't be afraid of what you're gonna say in intense conversations, that you have to remember everything. My spirit, I will remind you what you need to say when you need to say it. You can have confidence that my presence, my indwelling spirit will give you what you need in those moments. And then Jesus seemingly changes direction away from this conversation about the spirit of God and starts talking about peace. Now again, remember, you don't need to tell people to not be afraid unless they are. So Jesus is saying it again, maybe just looking at the look on their faces, don't be afraid, don't be troubled. My peace I give you is a different kind of peace than anywhere else you'll find in the world. Defining the word peace is a really important thing because even to us in the room, it means a lot of different things. Here's what that original Greek word that Jesus shared that night. It says here, peace, peace means wholeness. The idea when all essential parts are joined together. It looks a lot like the definition of the Hebrew word shalom, which also is described, translated as peace. It's when everything is functioning as it ought to. It was so cool. We had a guest speaker at HSM this week, and he asked a great question. He says, what is the definition of good? That's, a, that's actually hard, you know, to think about. What, how would you define that? And what I loved, one of the high school students said, things being as they should be. It's a great, great statement. And that's what Jesus is talking about, peace. The peace I leave you is when everything's, everything is joined together as it should be. And then you go, well, Todd, nothing in my life looks like that. I got all kinds of frayed edges, all kinds of different directions. And Jesus says, the kind of peace I'm giving you, even in the midst of all of the fray, that peace is all joined together. That's the peace that you can lean into. That's the peace that you can know. That's the peace that is otherworldly. And I would ask you today, doesn't that speak powerfully to you? That Jesus promises to give you the kind of peace that meets you where you are, that fills in gaps that are so obvious, brokenness that is so plain and to see. And Jesus says, I give you my peace that's perfect. My peace, my peace that's fully aligned. You know what so many of you have told me to my face or in an email? You've said, Todd, during this pandemic, there have been times when everything about my world seemed so distorted and chaotic. But I have somehow known the peace of Jesus in the midst of all of it or at least in the midst of a particular season. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's not saying you'll know peace when all of your world just comes together and everything goes as it should go. He's saying, I'm gonna give you a peace that in the midst of all the chaos, that peace is perfectly aligned. That peace is all put together. And when you have that, no matter how big the storm, in a very otherworldly way, you're able to say it as well. I have no other reason to say that. I have no other reason to think that it should be. But because of the peace that Jesus is giving me in the middle of this, it is well. In the same way that that should provide a great sense of comfort for you, can I tell you just the flip side? People in your relational world, Jesus says this peace is supernatural. Jesus says this peace is the peace I give. That means, by definition, it's a peace they don't know. It's a peace that has buoyed you up. It's a peace that's been a harbor in the midst of a crazy two-year period of time. But just note the people in your relational world that don't have Jesus don't have that peace. 
and the chaos that they have been in, they have looked for things to bring peace in different kinds of ways, and every one of them has been wanting. And it reminds us, God, you have given me, it's all because of you, you've given me something that the people in my world deeply need. In your notes, this is a reminder to all of us, we have that answer, that remedy And we're called not only to know it ourselves, but not keep it to ourselves. We're called not to just know this peace. We're called to not keep it just to us. To make the peace of Jesus known to those in our world who are restless, who are splintered, and not whole. When we talk about the idea of being people of influence in our relational worlds... Man, you walking out, not a, not a peace that never falters, not a peace that never fades, but when you walk in that peace in the midst of your turbulence, the people in your relational world are asking questions like, why are they not completely losing their mind? Why are they not just crawling on the floor right now? What is it that's giving them that sense of strength and confidence? And these are opportunities for us to share what has been so rich. He finishes this part of teaching them that they need not be troubled, that they need not be afraid. In the very first summer of the pandemic, so summer of 20, we did a series called Fear Not. And it was really powerful for me personally. I don't know what it did for you, but it's really great for me because what we did is we just looked at each at different times, Old Testament, New Testament, when either people acting as the voice of God, like meaning God says, tell these people this, or God himself speaking up and simply saying, don't be afraid. And we walked away with a great sense of confidence as we got into each of these narratives and we found ourselves in the story and we realized that God says the reason we ought not, the reason we don't have to be afraid is because he's there, because he's present, because he's strong, and because he is absolutely with us. Finally today, chapter 14, verse 28, you heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you'd be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I've told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. There's another one of those phrases. I'm trying to get ahead of this with you. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but, when he, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. There's a lot we could say about this last passage, but the one thing I just want to do, I want to draw you to that title that Jesus gives about the adversary, that Jesus gives for Satan. He calls him the prince of this world. Jesus knows exactly, remember how he started out this whole sequence? My hour has come. Everything's been leading up to this point. He knows exactly what's about to happen. The prince of this world is making his move. But what we're going to see is that the king reigns supreme. And he takes care of anything the prince wants to throw at him. And turns it into redemption. What's powerful about those last words, come, let us leave, they're going to leave this upper room, they're gonna go for a walk. And they're actually, what's so significant, Jesus is actually walking them to the place so he can be betrayed, so he can be tortured, so he can be crucified. And he's gonna do it for them. And here's what's so wild, and he's gonna do it for us. This is love. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your word. We are so grateful to understand these things that Jesus did and said, to understand his heart, to develop, to equip, to prepare his disciples God, you are gonna use them to literally flip the world upside down as we see in the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament. But these last moments were going to prove so pivotal. And you keep giving them understanding. You keep sharing with them, revealing 
who you are, who the Father is, and now even the fact that the very Spirit of God is going to indwell them. Father, would we take these words of Jesus this week and would we mull over them? Would they be a great source of both understanding and encouragement? And would we know your peace, the kind of peace only you can give? If you're here today and you would say, Todd, I don't know that peace. I've never responded to Jesus' invitation in the gospel and I really have never known a peace like Jesus describes in this passage. I just have great news for you today. You can. It begins when you understand that God created this world absolutely perfectly, but sin entered. And as a result, you and the rest of the human race, you have been born in and you demonstrate living a life apart from God's design. So A, it begins by admitting that you're a sinner who needs a savior. B, believing Believing that this Jesus that we've heard from his mouth throughout this passage today, Jesus is the only Savior available. See his choose. Choose to say, Jesus, I put my faith, I put my confidence in who you are and what you've done, not in what I can religiously do. And as a result, like you've said, out of my love for you, I simply want to obey. You can make that decision right here, right now, and I pray not another moment would go by until you do. Father, this week, encourage our hearts with these truths, especially these truths about the indwelling spirit that lives in us. Help us not stymie his work. Help us not try to ignore what we need so desperately, but live by his presence and power. We love you and we pray in the great name of Jesus. Amen.